all of your questions on the Q&A chat box. And if you find the session interesting, please share the link of our YouTube channel to your colleagues. I'm sure everybody's going to benefit from uh, this nice talk and uh, the discussion with all the amazing panelists in the end of it. Thank you very much for attending and uh, we see you all in the discussion. Well, good afternoon to you all, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you were able to listen to our first session on cardiac development, because today I'm going to try to link what we learned a month ago with what we are discussing now, which, as you see from the screen, is the development of the atrial chambers. So what are we going to do? If we're going to understand the development of the atrial chambers, and first of all, we need to know the identity of the building blocks that come together to form the definitive structures. And what we're going to do today is we're going to discuss mm -hmm. having identified those building blocks, where they come from. And in the process of doing that, I'll touch upon which of those components is most important to identify the atrial chambers when they are abnormal. So what we're doing is like a jigsaw puzzle. I hope you all appreciate what the nature of jigsaw puzzles are. When we're doing the jigsaw, first of all, we have to look at the pieces. But if we're going to put them together, we have to know what they are going to produce. So here are the pieces. In the picture I'm showing you, there are four pieces. But when we look at the atrial chambers, we have to take note of five features. So first of all, we have the body. Now, the body might not immediately be understandable to you. But as you will see, that is the basis on which we build the atrial chambers. And then we have the vestibule. Again, that's not a common term to describe the atrial chambers, but it's very important because that is the myocardium that builds into the atrioventricular junction. You're all familiar, I hope, with the appendage. And as I will show you, and as I hope you know, it is indeed the appendage that is of most significance in distinguishing between the atrial chambers when they are congenitally malformed. But then we need to take note of the venous components. And in many ways, the venous components are the most obvious features of the atrial chambers. And of course, to finish the whole thing, we need to know about the septum. And knowledge of the septum is key to understanding interatrial communications, also key to understanding the morphology of the lesions we now call atrioventricular septal defects. So these are the pieces, but we also need to know what they look like when we put them together. Now this is a picture that is a very complex jigsaw puzzle. This is painted by L.S. Lowry. He was a northerner. And this is showing the workers going to work. And this is very familiar to me because I spent my university time in Manchester and we were surrounded in Manchester at that time by the mills that are pictured here by L.S. Lowry. The atrial chambers are not quite as complicated as Lowry's picture, but we do need to know what they look like if we're going to put the pieces together. So here is the morphologically left atrium. Now, why am I starting with the morphologically left atrium? It is because, as I will show you, the larger part of the body ends up in the morphologically left atrium. And the body has smooth walls. If you look down through the window that Diane, this is one of Diane's great dissections. If you look down through the window she's created in the posterior wall of this left atrium, you can see the orifice of the mitral valve. And there, feeding into the orifice, we see the myocardium of the vestibule. 
that's smooth as well and it's confluent with the myocardium of the body and you'll see why that is the case as we begin to discuss development so here is the appendage and we can recognize the appendage because of its pectinate muscles and there on the dome of the morphologically left atrium we have the pulmonary venous sinus and as we look anteriorly we see the horns of the primary atrial septum which are the distinguishing feature of the septum in the morphologically left atrium so this is what we're going to put together and i'm going to fit those pieces into this end product the morphologically left atrium but of course we also need to look at the morphologically right atrium now the morphologically right atrium has a small part of the body but it is very small and as we will describe and as i'll explain to you it's between the systemic venous component and the septum and it's not always easy to identify the right atrium as you would expect also has a vestibule and as in the left atrium the vestibular myocardium is smooth but the dominating feature of the morphologically right atrium is the pectinate muscles of the appendage. And what I hope you can see, and what is the distinguishing feature of the morphologically right atrium, is that the pectinate muscles separate the smooth myocardium of the vestibule from the smooth myocardium of the systemic venous sinus. But we can also see a key feature that permits us to identify the systemic venous sinus in the morphologically right atrium, and that is the presence of the venous valves. Now, in this particular heart, you can see both the right venous valve and you can see the left venous valve. And that is helpful because it is the space between the left venous valve and the septum, which is the body of the right atrium. So here we have our two atrial chambers, each with their five components. We know the components. We know now how they come together. So now I need to tell you where they come from. Where were they derived and how do they achieve their final positions? So let's go back to the linear heart tube. And this is where we return to our opening session on cardiac development and i showed you this picture about a month ago it's from a mouse embryo and we can see that at this early stage during the ninth day of development in the mouse there is a straight heart tube so there is the larger part of the linear heart tube and as we discussed that will become the definitive left ventricle but already you can see the material that is growing in from the second heart field and as we will discuss, it is growth at the venous pole that is key for understanding atrial development. There is also growth at the arterial pole, and we'll discuss that in our next session in about a month's time when we talk about ventricular mass. And we'll also discuss this growth at the arterial pole when in our final session on cardiac development, we discuss the outflow tract. So that was what it looked like in the murine heart. This is what it looks like in the human heart. And it's one of those exquisite interactive PDF files that have been prepared by Professor Wout Lamas and Dr. Jill Hexpose. We've used these over and over again. They're from the human heart. And they prepared these in the Netherlands at the University of Maastricht. So this is what the situation looks like with the myocardium. So there in darker green, you see the myocardium of the left ventricle. And at this stage, the lighter green myocardium is showing you what will become the outflow tract. But we're going to concentrate today on what's going on at the venous pole. And so if we take away the myocardium, we can look at the cavities. So there, cavity of the putative left ventricle at the arterial pole we see it is continuous with what will become the outflow tract which is feeding the ventral aortas themselves will become the arteries of the first pharyngeal arch but if we look at the venous pole 
we can see emptying into the heart at this stage we have the umbilical veins on each side we have the vitelline veins and they come together to form the venous tributaries at this stage however we have no component of the atrium this is Carnegie stage 10. This is at the end of the fourth week of development. And if we move into the fifth week of development here in Carnegie stage 11, you can now see what is happening. The heart itself has looped. Now we can recognize the outflow tract, but we see at the inlet end of the loop what will become the atrioventricular canal. And now we can also see a little bit, for the first time we can recognize as what will be the body of the atrium. And this is key because the body of the atrium is part of this primary heart tube. So if we look at the venous tributaries, the umbilical veins, the vitelline veins have now come together and they're draining through the hepatocardiac channels, still bilaterally symmetrical, but now coming into the venous tributaries, we also have the tributaries from the embryo itself, and we call those the cardinal veins. So this is what it looks like in a reconstruction. And when we chart the ongoing development of this myocardium, reverting to what we discussed in our previous session, we need to distinguish primary from chamber myocardium. And this is particularly important in understanding the vestibule and the body of the developing atrial chambers. So these are the pictures I showed you in the previous session. They were made by my good friend and colleague, Anton Moorman, now retired. Anton was head of the Department of Anatomy and Embryology in the University of Amsterdam. And these are taken from a mouse embryo, serial sections, as you'll see very shortly. And this particular section has been stained by Anton to show you the location of atrial natriuretic factor. And what you can see is the trabeculations of the morphologic left ventricle are positive. And there we have positive myocardium forming the atrial appendage. But between we have that part which we can now recognize as the atrioventricular canal and the body of the developing atrial chambers. And it is negative. So Anton took an adjacent section, and this time he stained it for Conexit 40. Again, the trabeculations of the left ventricle are positive. The developing left atrial appendage is positive. But now we have negative still atrioventricular canal and body of left atrium. However, there is now another area of myocardium we introduced you to that in the last session, and this is the mediastinal myocardium. So the primary myocardium, which is part of the primary heart tube, is negative for both atrial natriuretic factor and connexin 40. And here is the key, the chamber myocardium, the apical trabecular components of the ventricles, the pectinated parts of the atrial chambers, they are positive and they are chamber myocardium and then we have the additional part that was negative for atrial natriuretic factor positive for connexin 40 this is the mediastinal myocardium and as i will show you that is key for understanding the development of the pulmonary vein so that primary myocardium will become the body of the atrial chamber it will also be the vestibule so if we look at that, taking you on a couple of stages here, we're now into the fifth week of development, Carnegie stage 13. And you see that not only has the ventricular part looped, but we're also having formation of the ventricular apical trabeculations. But we are concerned with the atrial chambers. And there now, there is a well-formed body that is confluent with the atrioventricular canal. However, ballooning out of the atrial body we have the two atrial appendages so this is what it looks like in wout and jaw's reconstruction i can show you the same thing in an episcopic section for one of tim mohan's wonderful episcopic data sets here from a human embryo 
at exactly the same stage. And now you will recognize, I hope, the part of the primary heart tube that will be of the formation of both the right and left atrial chambers. Primary myocardium, the atrial body. And this shows you very beautifully that it is confluent with more primary myocardium, the atrioventricular canal. And at this stage, the atrioventricular canal is supported exclusively by the developing left ventricle. But what I hope you can also see is that growing out of the atrial body, we have the left atrial appendage, right atrial appendage, and now coming in at the top of the atrial chamber, separated by those venous valves, we have the systemic venous tributaries. Now this is Carnegie stage 13, and at this stage, as I mentioned, the atrioventricular canal supported only by the developing ventricle. So the major change that takes place at ventricular level is expansion of the atrioventricular canal. And that gives the right ventricle its own inlet. So here we are one stage further, and now you can begin to see the four chambered organ. Because the atrioventricular canal has expanded to provide the inlet to the developing right ventricle. But something has also happened at the level of the atrioventricular canal. Because now the myocardium of the atrioventricular canal is becoming sequestrated as the vestibules of the atrial chambers. So there is the atrioventricular canal confluent with the body. Now, if you look on the inside of the ballooning right atrial appendage, you can see those pectinate muscles. And we can see how the left appendage is ballooning. We can now see the other key point, and that is the primary atrial septum. And it is the growth of the primary atrial septum that will determine how much of this atrial body ends up in the right as opposed to ending up in the left atrial chamber. So to summarize what we've learned thus far, the vestibules are the remnants of atrioventricular canal myocardium, and they are primary myocardium. <laughs> the appendages are ballooning again from the atrial component of the primary heart tube, and they are chamber myocardium. So this is key because you're all well aware that it is the morphology of the appendages that permit us in the postnatal heart to distinguish between what is morphologically right and what is morphologically left. So how do those atrial appendages achieve their definitive morphology? And this all comes down to the sequence of how they grow out from the body of the atrium, and this is what we call ballooning. And I've shown you this cartoon on several occasions. Again, it's one made by Anton Moorman. The silver part is the primary heart tube. And what Anton is showing you is that the atrial appendages are ballooning in parallel from the body of the atrium, which is the primary heart tube, whereas the apical parts of the ventricle are ballooning in series. So let me emphasize that again at atrial level. The appendages balloon in parallel fashion. At ventricular level, they balloon in series. And this is why it is only the atrial appendages that can be isomeric. So again, I showed you this last time, but let me tell you again that it is under the influence of the so-called laterality genes. But these appendages become either morphologically right or morphologically left. And it is the gene PITX2 that is responsible for producing morphological leftness. And morphological leftness is the default option. But in the normal situation, another set of genes, of which, which include lefty one nodal, sonic hedgehog, who's also in this family, and they prevent PITX2 crossing the midline. So let's look at what happens in the linear heart tube. Everything that is to the left of the midline will become morphologically left. And if those other genes are subserving their function, they will not cross to the right side. So the right side will 
develop to become morphologically right. But this is at the straight heart tube stage. Looks what happens when we've had formation of the ventricular loop. Because now when we look in the body of the atrium, we see that it has a right half that is distinguishable from the left heart. So under the influence of these genes, what we see to our left hand now will become morphologically right. What we see to our left hand will become morphologically left. But when we compare the ventricles that are going to grow either from the inlet of the ventricular loop or from the outlet of the ventricular loop, we see that both of the developing left ventricles will be under the influence of genes for leftness and rightness. So they will not show the evidence of isomerism. And we can now prove this by knocking out those genes. So this is one of the scanning electron micrographs made by Nigel Brown, with whom I worked quite some time. And I hope you will recognize that having knocked out the PITEX2 gene responsible for leftness, we only have rightness left, and both of these appendages are morphologically right. Whereas if we knock out the genes responsible for producing that midline barrier, in this lovely section sent to me by Professor Maino from Japan, who knocked out lefty one, we have bilateral morphologically left appendages. So it is the appendages that are responsible for atrial identity, and they respond to the laterality genes. But let's now come back. We've now discussed the, 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 the uh, vestibule, discuss the body, we discuss the appendage. So now we need to concentrate on the venous tributaries. So I have returned, as you see, to Carnegie stage 12, quite early. Now you can see the atrial body. There is the cup part of the atrioventricular canal. The appendages are only beginning to balloon. But look at the venous tributaries, because we have symmetry. On each side, we have an umbilical vein. We have the vitiline veins, they're coming together into the hepatocardiac channels. But we also have the cardinal veins. At this stage, on each side, these systemic venous horns are joining together into the atrial body. So to start off with, we have symmetry. If, however, we're eventually going to septate the atrial chambers, and that will be the final step we will discuss, we need to move the systemic venous sinus so that it opens only to the right side of the body of the atrium. So this is the same stage. I've rotated it just a little bit. The body, the body, of course, <coughs> is attached to the pharyngeal mesenchyme through the body stalk, which we call the dorsal mesocardium. And that's going to be important, as you will see, because it provides the entrance for the pulmonary vein. But the systemic veins at this stage both drain together into their sinus horns, cardinal veins, the umbilical veins, the vitiline veins, but each of those sinus horns at this stage is in communication with the body, the atrium. So we cannot septate the body at this stage. We have to move the systemic sinuses so that they open to the right side. And this happens very rapidly. So one Carnegie stage later, during the fifth week of development, there has been a shift of the systemic venous sinus. So now it is opening only to the right side of the body of the atrium. And it's done that by incorporating the left sinus horn into the developing left atrioventricular junction. And now the body of the atrium is mostly committed to the left side of the developing atrial component. And a space has appeared between the walls of what will be the left atrium and what will end up as the coronary sinus. And I can show you that very nicely if we look at a data set from the front. So now the right side is to your left hand, the left side is to your right hand. And you can very nicely see how the venous valves are demarcating the extent of the systemic venous sinus, opening into it. We have superior cable vein, 
inferior cable vein and there the left sinus horn and if you look carefully you can see how the left sinus horn has its own walls which are now discrete from the walls of the body the atrium but you can also see the beginning of growth of the primary septum and it is the area between the primary septum and the left venous valve that is the part of the body of the atrium that is committed to the developing right atrium so there is the larger part of the body and it's staying on the left side the left appendage has ballooned from there but the systemic venous sinus has now interpolated itself between the body of the right atrium and the right atrial appendage and that is why the pectinate muscles now interpose between the vestibules and the body and the systemic venous component of the morphologically right atrium and it is this shift of the systemic venous sinus that sets the scene for septation so i've shown you how the right atrium achieves its venous component but what about the left atrium and of course the building block for the left atrium are the pulmonary veins and now the veins use that persisting communication between the heart tube the pharyngeal mesenchyme to gain their access to the body of the atrium and that is the dorsal mesocardium so i can show you that best by reverting to nigel's scanning electron micrographic picture of the primary heart tube in the mouse and remember now we can see the primary atrium that is growing at the venous pole of the heart we can cut off the left ventricle and we can look down into that atrial component and this is what it looks like the back is now at the top the sternum the front of the developing mouse is to the bottom and there you see the gut and beautifully i hope you see the body stalk that is connecting the atrial chambers to the gut through the dorsal mesocardium and the pulmonary vein is going to use that strand in the midline at the site of the dorsal mesocardium to connect together the veins that are developing in the lung buds with what will be the left atrium but at this stage we have the venous sinus horns and you see the left sinus horn is on the left side and that would be in the way if things proceeded like this but i've already shown you that there is a shift rightwards of this left sinus horn now the development of the pulmonary vein has been controversial and for quite some time there has been suggestions that the pulmonary vein itself is derived from the systemic venous sinus in fact this is not true as i've already explained the pulmonary vein has its own myocardium mediastinal myocardium and again it was experiments done by anton moorman that showed that having shifted the left sinus horn across the pulmonary vein had no connection with the systemic venous sinus so this is what the mouse looks like after that systemic venous sinus has moved across you can see there the pulmonary veins marking off the boundary of the systemic venous sinus and they are away from these mounds that are now marking the dorsal mesocardium and pulmonary vein is opening between them it has no connection with the systemic venous sinus in fact it starts quite close to the atrioventric the junction this is a section i'm showing you of a human heart there you see the body of the left atrium the ballooning apical component of the left ventricle and the atrioventricular canal the left sinus horn with its own walls has now been incorporated within the developing left atrioventricular junction and directly adjacent to that you see the opening of the pulmonary vein so the pulmonary veins are part of mediastinal myocardium they have no relationship with the systemic venous sinus and this is the evidence that Anton Moorman prepared uh, to show you to prove that the pulmonary vein has no association with the systemic venous tributaries he's marked here in ready purple 
the gene NKX 2.5. And you see that is marking all the atrial myocardium. It's also marking the outflow tract myocardium. But it is not marking the walls of the systemic venous sinus and the left sinus horn. Again, Anton took an adjacent section to this. And here you see how the purpley reddish tissue are enclosing the opening of the pulmonary vein. But when we look at the adjacent section, we see that that myocardium that had been marked with NKX 2.5 is no longer marked. But what Anton has done here is to use the transcription factor TBX18, and that is now shown in green. So what you see, TBX18 is delimiting the systemic venous sinus, and it's delimiting the left sinus horn, but it is not showing the opening of the pulmonary vein, nor does it show pulmonary vein as that tracks back into the lung buds. The pulmonary vein has nothing to do with the systemic venous sinus. It is developed within the dorsal mesocardium from a midline strand, and it is made, its wall is then mediastinal myocardium. It starts off, however, very close to the atrioventricular junction. And we can see that again here in Wout's and Jill's reconstruction. So now you're looking at the reconstruction from behind. The left side is to your left hand. There you see the left sinus horn. And in green, you see the opening of the pulmonary vein. And it is surrounded by this purpley red tissue, which is the boundaries of the dorsal mesocardium. And one of these is particularly important. It is the vestibular spine. And we're going to see a lot of the vestibular spine as we complete this session, because the vestibular spine muscularizes. So here we've moved on a bit. I'm showing you a four chamber section. We're at seven weeks now of development. Hopefully you can recognize the primary atrial septum. And it has on its leading edge a mesenchymal cap, and that has muscularized. But the vestibular spine has also muscularized. Note, if you will, the systemic venous component, and between it and the primary atrial septum, you now see the small part of the body of the right tatrium. There is the left superior cable vein. And you see that the pulmonary venous component is beginning to migrate up onto the atrial roof. And in so in doing, the left atrium is cannibalizing its branches. Here, just a little bit later, there's been ongoing canalization. A similar image. You see the pulmonary venous component. But now, as the veins are incorporated on the roof of the left atrium, they form the superior interatrial fold. And it is against that fold, the primary atrial septum abuts to close the oval foramen. And we'll get to that very shortly, but you see now how small part of the right atrial body is committed to the right side, a larger part of the body weight is staying on the left side, but another key feature has taken place because the vestibular spine has now muscularized and developed together with the mesenchymal cap that is producing the second atrial septum. So returning to our building blocks, when we consider the pulmonary veins, they canalize within the dorsal mesocardium from the midline strand. The left atrium then brings in those pulmonary veins to form the pulmonary venous sinus, and only after the incorporation of the pulmonary veins can we recognize the superior interatrial fold. Now, most of the textbooks you read will still tell you that superior interatrial fold is the second atrial septum. In fact, that is not the case. And I'm going to show you now what truly happens during atrial septation. We've already seen how it is the transfer of the systemic venous tributaries to the right side of the body of the atrium that sets the scene for septation. And I can show you that again by reverting to this early stage, right atrium, left atrium, atrioventricular canal connected to developing left ventricle, 
But there we see the growth of the primary septum. And the growth of the primary septum is going to put most of the body of the atrium into the left side. But now we need to look at its leading edge. Because on the leading edge, we see a mesenchymal cap. And we can see the process of septation much better if we use mouse material. So here is that stage where the atrial septum, the primary septum, is beginning to grow towards the atrioventricular canal. You'll note that we've had expansion of the, atri of the atrioventricular canal itself. So the right ventricle has its own inlet. But now I can show you the primary septum, which has broken down from the atrial roof to give us the secondary foramen. On the leading edge of the primary septum, we have the mesenchymal cap, and it's growing towards the inferior atrioventricular cushion. And between the mesenchymal cap and cushion, we have the primary atrial foramen. And having broken down to form the secondary foramen, the embryo is now able to close that primary foramen. And that is done by ongoing growth of the primary septum itself. And so if we take another episcopic data, data set a little later in development in the mouse, we see again the primary septum, the mesenchymal cap, the inferior cushion. We can see at this stage the primary foramen is very nearly closed. But now we can see that other key player that is growing in through the right side of the dorsal mesocardium, and that is the vestibular spine. Now, the vestibular spine has a long history. It was first shown by Wilhelm Hiss, the senior. And here, his picture shows us very beautifully how it is growing in spine-like fashion towards the atrioventricular canal. And it reinforces the base of the atrial septum. There it is. You see, it is pushing the pulmonary vein towards the left atrium. And we can also see it in the developing human embryo, four-chamber section again. I hope you will recognize this. There is the vestibular spine. You can now see its continuity with the pharyngeal mesenchym. It is the most prominent part now of the dorsal mesocardium. It is now fused with the inferior atrioventricular cushion and has made sure that the pulmonary vein is opening to the left side into the body of the left atrium. So if we show you now a mouse heart when septation has been completed, you see the primary septum and its mesenchymal cap. The mesenchymal cap is fused with the superior cushion. The superior cushion has fused with the inferior cushion. And the boundary between the two has been reinforced by the vestibular spine. And it is now muscularization of the vestibular spine and the mesenchymal cap that will form that second component of the atrial septum. So this is the true septum secundum. You see the roof of the atrium is still flat. As yet, there has been no incorporation of the pulmonary vein, so we do not have a superior interatrial fold. That doesn't happen until the pulmonary veins reach the atrial roof. Now the spine and the cap are muscularized to give us the secondary septum. Forming the floor of the oval fossa, we have the primary septum, and there are the boundaries of the oval fossa, and its cranial margin now is the infolding that is the superior interatrial fold. And the primary septum just overlap and abut this fold, but it is the muscularized spine and cap that is the true second atrial septum. So if I summarize that for you in a series of diagrams, here you see the four chamber arrangement. Systemic venous sinus is moved to the right side, I'm showing you the location of the dorsal mesocardium. And there, growing from the atrial roof, we have the primary septum with its mesenchymal cap. And it is the space between the mesenchymal cap and the cushions that is the primary foramen. So there is growth of the primary septum itself. And that reduces the size of the primary foramen between the mesenchymal cap and the atrioventric cushions.
then the top part of the primary septum breaks down to give us the secondary foramen. Note now, I'm showing you the pulmonary vein that is opening between the mounds that mark the atrial entrance of the dorsal mesocardium. So this is what happens to complete atrial septation. Primary foramen has been closed by the mesenchymal cap fusing with the cushions. And on the right side, that has been reinforced by growth of the vestibular spine. It is now the space between the top of the primary septum and the atrial roof that is the secondary foramen. So what is it that produces the fold against which the secondary foramen will eventually abut to close the oval foramen? It is infolding of the superior atrial roof. And that occurs as the pulmonary veins achieve their position in the roof of the left atrium. And it is that incorporation of the pulmonary veins that gives us the superior interatrial fold against which the floor of the, the oval fossa will abut and the floor is a flap valve. But it is the vestibular spine, the mesenchymal cap, that will muscarize to form the true second septum, which is the antero inferior buttress. And then we have the oval fossa between that buttress and the superior fold. So we can see that very nicely in the definitive heart. So your left hand now, you're seeing the right atrium. Your right hand, you see the left atrium. And there to the right side, we have the aortic root. And in the normal heart, we can now very beautifully see the oval fossa. And we can see that making the floor of the oval fossa, we have the primary atrial septum. And there is the true second atrial septum. This is the muscularized vestibular spine mesenchymal cap. It is the antero inferior buttress of the atrial septum. What many call septum, second septum is in fact the superior interatrial fold. So if I summarize all of that, it is the primary septum forms the floor of the overfossa. The second septum is that muscularized antero inferior buttress, and that's derived from the mesenchymal cap and the vestibular spine. And what most of the textbooks call the septum secundum is properly considered as the superior interatrial fold. So there we are. We've looked at the pieces. We've put them together. So now I can confirm for you the origin of those atrial components. The body is primary heart tube, as are the vestibules. They are derived from the atrioventricular canal. It is the appendages that confer morphological rightness or leftness on the atrial chambers. They are chamber myocardium and they balloon from the primary heart tube. Venous components are formed separately. The systemic venous component from the systemic venous tributaries, the pulmonary vein from mediastinal myocardium. And then, finish the situation, the septum. We have the primary septum, forms the floor of the oval fossa. We have the secondary muscularized spine and cap, which form its antero inferior buttress. So there we are, components come together and this is the origin of the morphologically right the morphologically left atrial chambers thank you all for your attention thank you dr anderson it was as usual very very good i think we can start with norman is that okay dr silverman well thank you very much uh, bob for that uh, brilliant uh, description um, I was able to follow that uh, quite clearly, and I really don't have um, many questions. I think the last thing was the inferior muscular buttress, which I think that you clearly defined as part of the, um, the vestibular spine and uh, the primary septum. But um, I, I do think that uh, this was very dense and uh, requires a review and review to get uh, to understand it all.
Uh, I think it was beautiful in the sense that you uh, made it like a jigsaw puzzle and um, uh, described each one of the events as they occurred uh, in sequence and then finally put it all together so that we could look at that in the normal heart and recognize which components of the atrial uh, chambers are which and where they develop from. So thank you very much for that, Bob. I don't really think I have any uh, additional insights because uh, you have uh, made it so clear. Perhaps Diane or Adrian have something else to add as questions to you. Let's listen to the other members of the panel. And guys, if you have questions, please type on the Q&A uh, chat box. I'm sure everybody is going to be very happy to answer. I, I don't have any questions, but I agree with Norman that every time I watch this, uh, things become more clear uh, and I can easily associate with the, the embryology with how some of these defects that we see uh, happen uh, and can occur uh, as very close cousins to one another. Yeah. I, I think, Bob, the, uh, the reason for silence is uh, 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 not because of confusion. It's uh, because that it's hard to actually assimilate this all in one go. And uh, I think that's uh, the beauty of having these sessions on the, um, the YouTube channel so that you can go back again and look at them again and listen to um, the uh, parts of the seminar that are not part of the visual, but take uh, your comments and amplify the um, morphology so clearly. I think another of the problems that we have to, to get to grips with is that some of the terms I've been using are not in sort of widespread use when we think of normal atrial anatomy. So the body, for example, the body, the importance of the body has only become clear to me as I've started looking at the development. And in many, and the thing that brought home the importance of the body, where previously I tended to think of it in terms of the venous component and the appendage, but then when you look at uh, when you look at totally anomalous pulmonary venous connection, then there is still a large part of the chamber remaining despite the appendage and despite the lack of the pulmonary veins. And that's what brought home to me the significance of the body. Then the vestibule is not something that is in general use. Yet now when I look what happens to the atrioventricular canal, to me, that's what these episcopic data sets have shown so most clearly that without question, it's the atrioventricular canal that becomes incorporated as that smooth walled myocardium that is the atrial vestibules. And Adrian, I think you had a question about that, did you not? Yes, and uh, I think there is another participant who asked that question because the jigsaw um, pieces is not that uh, we have to know which one are they, but they move because as you see, the pulmonary vein starts low and then it goes up. The same thing happens with the systemic venous component, it moves. So my question was, we still don't have veins as a separate segment. So we cannot discuss the veno-atrial junction in the same way we discuss atrioventricular ventricular arterial junction. Is that correct? I know there were some discussions. I think you can disc I think you can find the venoatrial junction in the right atrium because of the the persistence of the venous valves. The in fact the heart that I use, which is one of Diane's hearts, she tells me that I didn't quite illustrate it correctly. And what I thought were the two venous valves was in fact a fold in the right venous valve. But Diane also does have hearts in which she has found the left venous valve. And in fact, the left venous valve is oftentimes applied even more closely to the septum than, than I gave the impression in, in when I annotated her heart. And maybe, Diane, you'd like to comment on that, because in fact, there's very little 
of the body that you can identify as such in the definitive right atrium. And you are correct, Adrian, that in the left atrium, there is no way we know where the pulmonary venous myocardium stops and the myocardium of the body begins because it's all become ordinary working myocardium. So I think that is one of the problems. You and I were discussing this when we met last week, that when we take the heart, oftentimes it's very difficult to dissect these embryologic components. And so we are left with putting the pieces of the jigsaw together as best we can, and then drawing inferences from what we know about the development. I think those inferences now are pretty accurate. I mean, Diane, would you like to comment on how often you find the left venous valve? Yeah, I've, I've actually been looking at a bunch of the normal hearts that I have here uh, for the uh, presence of the both the eustachian valve and the left venous valve. And uh, I have seen hearts where the left venous valve remains as a second layer over top of the uh, entire expanse of the primary atrial septum or the floor of the oval fossa. I've seen uh, trabecular meshwork representing the left venous valve in this area. And I've also seen between the body and the inferior aspect of the oval fossa, uh, little lips of tissue that represent the left venous valve. As well, we've been looking uh, at the septum sparium and which is also, I believe, part of the left venous valve. Is that correct, Bob? Well, it's the superior commissure. It's the commissure between the venous valves. The superior commissure is what we call the septum spurium. The inferior commissure comes together into the vestibular spine, in fact, and the vestibular spine takes it forward and brings it all together into the antero inferior buttress. But all of yeah, them. So uh, up in that area, I have also seen some little remnants of venous valves, uh, and as well, as you all know, the eustachian valve can be quite prominent and fenestrated, or, or it can almost be non-existent, and you just see where the tendon of Tadaro uh, is pulling above the coronary sinus. So there's quite a bit of variation in the venous valves uh, that actually I've been looking at. I'm, I'm trying to put together a bunch of photographs and, and try to get something uh, put together on this. I had a, a BS student help me this summer look at some of these hearts. And, and so now I just have to pull everything together. So it's very well, interesting. What we see is the more we look at these things and we when we try to relate them to the embryology, because there's no question in the developing heart. I think I hope you're all able to see in the cross section, in the sections I showed of the developing heart, it was much easier to see that space between the left venous valve and the developing septum. And in fact, in the mouse heart, you can see it much better in the definitive heart because the, the venous valves are maintained to a far greater extent in the mouse heart than they are in the human heart. So we can, we can to an extent, validate what we see by looking at the, the models that we have. And uh, on the same note, addressing also the first question, that area between the coronary sinus opening and the uh, inferior caval vein opening. That's part of the initial shift that the left sinus horn moves and that's venous tissue embryologically. There Correct. is an area that is continuous that could also explain why we can see totally anomalous pulmonary venous connection in that area. Indeed. Uh, the first- but, uh, but you are correct, it is venous tissue and that as you imply, that starts off outside the heart and then is incorporated within the heart as the sinus horns are incorporated into the, into the body of the atrium. And the body of the atrium by this time has ballooned out its appendages. So as you say, it shifts and it, it interpolates itself on the right side. June. You've been listening carefully also. Do you have any comments? I know you, you're, uh, you're, uh, you have a degree of skepticism about our use of development. Uh, it looks like he had to step away. Ah, okay. Well, we can can I ask you a question about the, the left venous valve and the oval fossa? Is there any remnant on the oval fossa of the left venous valve? Well, Diane can answer that. Yes, Diane, please. 
I'm sorry, Norman, I was reading a question in the chat. Can you repeat your oh, question? Okay, the, my question is, is there any um, part of the left venous valve that is associated with the oval fossa that, for, that you see? Because the right venous valve does attach to the oval fossa. And I assume that the space between the right and left venous valves is there. What happens to the left venous valve vis-a-vis -vis the atrial septum? Uh, I have, I have actually, a, the first one I ever appreciated was in a 74-year-old man where I saw a, a two, two, essentially two flat valves at the floor of the oval fossa, but one of them, the anterior most one, was actually a prominent left venous valve. And I have a four-chamber section of that atrial septum where you can see the, the primum portion of the septum and then a thinner uh, second membrane anterior to it, which is the left venous valve. And the reason I noted it was there were a few fenestrations along the superior aspect, so I was able to easily place a probe uh, between that venous valve and the uh, flat valve at the floor of the oval fossa or the primary septum. And this is actually what started me looking at some of these things. And at the Lurie Children's Hospital in Chicago, I have some re really nice images of uh, these uh, left venous valves that are quite fenestrated over top of the flat valve at the floor of the oval fossa. So um, I hope to soon get this stuff all put together so that we can uh, alert people to look for these things. Well, it would be interesting to have a look at that because uh, the old embryology suggested that the rim of the limbus of the oval fossa was made up of the left venous valve. And that, I think, from today's session is uh, pretty clear that it's not the case. Is that Correct. right? Correct. We've got some questions, I see. I'm uh, that we need to answer. We have a couple of questions from my very good friend, Francis Bulock, who says, what happens to the inferior uh, venous drainage from the left side? Does it just shrivel up? I guess that's what happens. I <laughs> can't say that for sure, but I think that's what happens. And Francis also asked the question, the inferior sinus venosis defect, she's calling it an atrial septal defect, she means an interatrial communication, does it have a similar origin as the superior one? And it does. The difference, of course, is that to produce the inferior sinus venosis defect, you have anomalous connection of the inferior pulmonary vein. So the right inferior pulmonary vein then hooks itself into the inferior cable vein whilst retaining its connection with the left atrium. Whereas in the superior sinus venosis defect, it's the superior uh, right pulmonary vein that achieves a connection to the superior cable vein, retaining its connection with the left atrium. And in fact, we now know you can have an intermediate sinus venosis defect where the hole is in the middle between the superior cable vein, the inferior cable vein. And that's a bit akin to what Adrian was, was talking about Total, uh, totally anomalous pulmonary venous connection into the back of the left atrium. Norman, you you told me you, you've seen several of these, have you not? I, yes, I, I have. doubted them. Correct. In fact, uh, we, when you visited San Francisco, we showed you that, uh, that example, and uh, it, it was very clear when you uh, pointed it out to us. Because Adrian now has a case that they've seen recently in Birmingham, so... Yes, we've, we've just operated on it, and it, it was shown very nicely um, how the uh, collector chamber was very close to the um, inferior cavel vein orifice. So with a snare over the inferior cavel vein, you were able to obstruct, actually, to, you were not able to see the pulmonary vein's entrance. And it was in that area between the orifice of the inferior cavel vein and the orifice of the coronary sinus, which I think embryologically is a is a venous area. Correct. And Norman, is that where yours drained also? Yes, correct. Right, so we also have a question from Muna Kanan, who asks, how can we explain juxtaposition of the atrial appendages? And we presume that is because when the outflow tract reorientates itself subsequent to the ventricular loop, it positions itself either to the right or the left, so that as the appendages balloon, they balloon usually to its left side, 
on occasion to its right side. I say that off the top of my head, but that's the explanation I would offer. We also have a question from Vital Kumar Batijari. Excuse me if I presented that wrong. What differentiates the inferior sinus phenosis defect from the posterior ASD or oval fossa defect in terms of its margins? And of course, the difference there is the anomalous pulmonary venous connection. Because to get the inferior sinus venosus defect, you have to have anomalous connection of the inferior right pulmonary vein into the inferior cable vein. Whereas in the, uh, in the oval fossa defect with shunting of the inferior cable vein, the pulmonary veins are all normally into the left atrium. And then we also have a question from Ami, from Francis, refers to what, above comment refers to the venous valves. Don't understand that, but I, June, you wanted to say something? Yes, so the, uh, the, the explanation regarding the uh, embryogenesis or far posterior aspect of intraatrial uh, septation is very fascinating. So I entirely agree with you. The posterior part of the, uh, that is the infolding secondary to pulmonary venous engagement into the left atrium. So evidence by very nicely, superior sinus venosis defect and inferior for sinus venosis defect. Regarding that, the diagnostic marker for superior inferior sinus venosis defect is so-called bold, bold sign. All the sign means that there is no remnant at all, any ridge along the posterior wall of the atrium when you have superior sinus or inferior sinus in the effect. So that differentiates the cases with the low line fossa ovalis defect. When you have low line fossa ovalis defect, you always have some spur like projection into the atrial cavity. Then it's a huge sense that. So that the posterior part of the so-called secundum part of the, the atria septum is due to infolding. But however, I'm interested in looking at the cases more carefully. What it means is that in superior sinus venosus defect, what happened is that I usually see that the remnant of the superior limb was still existing. So I wonder, most of that part of the septum is due to infolding, why still, vestibular spine contributes a little bit of that part too. Because in sinus spinosis defect, I see, most of the time I see still small limb of superior limbus existing. So they still have a two components. One is the infolding and the other is that uh, origin from other part of so-called the lower part of second, the septum secundum. I mean, it all depends on what you mean by the septum secundum. <laughs> so it's a kind of insidious merge of two components. So but I think, I think that the vestibular spine only contributes to the anterior inferior buttress. I don't see the vestibular spine having any contribution to make to the roof or the posterior wall of the atrium. I think you that know you that the front posterior for forward, it may bifurcate around the fossal valleys. But I think you can still have an infolding, <laughs> yeah. uh, even when the pulmonary vein is hooking into the superior, the, the, uh, the venous sinus. I still think it's feasible to have an infolding to give yeah. the, the yeah. fold you're looking for. The very yeah. fact that it is a fold, I think, would rule out the possibility that the vestibular spine is contributing. But yeah. what yeah. do we know? Yeah, I, I, I enjoyed all the, most of the, I really learned a lot by the, uh, listening to you today. But however, I'm interested in looking at the, a little bit more of the detail of lower margin of, or upper margin of superior inferior sinus venosus feedback to give you more insight into where that part is solely from infolding or there could be some more contribution from other structures. Well, I think you, you have the, uh, the three-dimensional data sets where you yeah. can look into that in far more yeah. de detail than we can. That's true. And I mean, yeah. the, beauty, the, the beauty there, of course, is that nowadays yeah. in the autopsy lab, we very rarely see sinus yeah. versus defects. Yeah. So yeah. you have the wherewithal now in your three-dimensional yeah. data set to, yeah. to, to make the, uh, the, the reconstructions and you'll be able to tell us. Yeah, yeah. 
That's true. Thank you. I mean, it is interesting, is it not, that nowadays with the three-dimensional data sets, you see much more of cardiac anatomy than we do when we have the hearts in our hands. So, <laughs> so I think that the computed tomography and the yeah. interrogation of, of 3D yeah. data sets is, is yeah. really, you are tomorrow's cardiac anatomists. <laughs> so the, the two of can be that imaging finding of final stenosis is that you should do not have any spell coming into the atrial cavity from the posterior wall. That is the simple telltale sign. We shall have this to wait and see what the, you find. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're obviously still worried about COVID. You've got your mask on. Well, no, the, I'm doing the, the, the MRI now. I'm the, the doing two tests at the same time. <laughs> that's ah, so it's not <laughs> COVID scandal. that's doing that for you. <laughs> Does anybody else have any more comments? Uh, Bob, I have, I have a comment on the question that was asked about the um, the left side of the, the venous anatomy just sh shriveling up. Yep. When you think about everything shifting to the right, um, that, that's how we eventually end up with our IVC inferior cable vein on the on the right and uh, our azagous vein to the right. So everything intra abdominally, there are all kinds of. Um, uh, venous tributaries that come and go. Uh, in fact, the inferior cable vein, as you know, is formed by several different components from all of those venous structures within the abdomen. So I, I think maybe, maybe I'm thinking incorrectly, but I think everything is shifting to the right and that's where all the preferential flow goes. So everything on the left just shrivels up. up. <laughs> indeed, indeed. I'm happy with that explanation. There are a few questions if you want to address. Are there some more? Yes. If you look in the questions. From Ami, Am, Amian Rath, what is the mechanism of TAPVC and PAPVC if pulmonary veins are not associated in any way with the systemic venous system? Well, there are, in fact, collateral veins. So throughout the door, the around the dorsal mesocardium, there are initially collateral channels between the developing veins in the lung buds and the systemic veins adjacent. And should the pulmonary vein not canalize, then those collateral veins take over the role of draining the pulmonary venous system. But that does not mean that the pulmonary vein itself comes from the systemic venous sinus. So that is the big difference. It is the pulmonary vein that canalizes within the midline of the dorsal mesocardium that is the one that has no association with the systemic venous sinus, but there are prior to that collateral channels between the developing lung buds and the adjacent systemic veins. And it's the proportion of those collateral channels that persist that give you either totally anomalous pulmonary venous connection or partially anomalous pulmonary venous connection. So there is the answer to uh, Dr. Rath's question. For another one from, you understand the other one, Adrian? So uh, if it's from Dr. Betty Gary, he asks two questions. He thinks that we change from superior and inferior atrioventricular cushions to anteroinferior buttress. I think this is a separate structure. Oh, I haven't seen that question. That yeah. is totally separate. They, they are completely separate structures. I, I don't have that question in my box. Uh, so if you look at the uh, Q&A, it's the last question. So, oh, Q&A. Uh, yeah. Oh, I'm looking at chat, not Q&A. Sorry, no, my fault, my fault. Oh, we go. I've, I haven't seen all those. So there's lots of questions in Q&A. We've also got one from Dr. Yu saying, does the atrial input to the AV node develop from the vestibular myocardium? Absolutely. And we will discuss that next in the next session when we talk about development of the ventricles. And I'll talk about the remodeling of the primary fold. And part of that is in the vestibule. So that is absolutely correct. The floor of the triangle of cock indeed is again vestibular myocardium. So that is another important point. 
And Asil Abad says, should we avoid using the term septum secundum? Not if you're going to use it properly. So if you recognize that the anteroinferior inferior buttress is the second septum, then that is the proper septum. What you should not do is called the superior interatrial fold, the septum secundum. And then Dr. Bettigeri, why to change inferior and superior cushions to the anteroinferior buttress? We have not done that. The anteroinferior buttress is on the atrial side of the cushions. So the superior and inferior atrioventricular cushions produce the insulating mechanism. And it is then the insulate, and then the vestibular spine, the mesenchymal cap, produce the myocardium that is on the atrial side of the insulating mechanism. And this is what uh, my good friend Merrill Cohen calls the septum of the atrioventricular canal. But the point about the septum of the atrioventricular canal is that it ends up in the atrial chambers as the anteroinferior buttress and not on the ventricular side. But we are not suggesting that the cushions change. The cushions become the insulating tissue and they form the so-called central fibrous body. So I think we've answered them all now, haven't we, Adrian? Uh, unless there is anything in the chat, but I don't I couldn't think... find anything else in the chat. No, Grace, there are repeated questions. are you questions. still with us? Yes, I'm here. So Amazing. Are, are you happy? I'm very happy. I, I, I really think there was a lot of questions today, and it shows how important is this, this topic. Thank you very much for the presentation and for the session uh, of all the panelists. And so we will con continue then at the end of March, the last week of March, or the penultimate week of March, when we will be discussing the formation of the ventricles. So thank you all for your presence. Thank you all for your questions. And enjoy the weekend. Thank you, guys. Thank you. <laughs>